uh, worked out to some extent what they would like to say. Yeah, we've done that. We just don't know how to get started. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'll pick up what you said. What about the intersections? You know, that's, that's another thing. I think what you said something very important that the other masters, which was an exhibition on five, you describe it, is probably as important as the modern movement of, um, what was his name, uh, um, Raza and all the rest. Progressive Arts Group. Yeah, except what was wonderful about India, when I got back in the 55, both were equally important. There was no need to be modern. The rest of India was accessible. When I loved Handloom, it wasn't because of Gandhi. It wasn't political. It was just so stunningly beautiful. When I saw some, some, um, you know, you'd see, you'd see some drawing, one of these old tantric drawings. They were like a Paul Clay. They spoke to you. Today it's sad that people choose between being ethnic and being modern. How stupid. <laughs> you know, the design is to see right through that. So I think if you had to choose between these two exhibitions, I would think the five other masters is more important because it opens our eyes to what we weren't looking at for all the way through centuries, at least the whole of the 19th century. And we had lost that. The other day, excuse me, I've lost my voice, so I'm going to sound like something out of the Godfather or worse. <laughs> that's, that's sorry. But don't forget, you've got to respect me. <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry, sir. And, and, um, there was a meeting of um, the uh, editorial board of MAG and a whole lot of very bright people were there, um, you know, for, for films and for photography. And what, hey, how are you going, Edgar? <laughs> you are our best audience. And someone else come. You know, and then we, um, what's the, they all said something I'd never thought about. They said India had engaged, had engaged in this dialectic between the past. Like Nehru wrote a book on the discovery of India. It was a brand new nation. But he also wanted to open a door to another future. That's amazing to do both these things. And you notice that Mandela took any great leader tries to do that. Now, India had about 30 or 40 years of such, I mean, it goes back to the 30s, I would imagine, you'd know more. But at least 25 years, right up to 1990, of a huge engagement in painting, in music, in dance, in architecture, in writing, between what is the relevance of the brand new, of the shock, the shock of the new to our heritage and vice versa. And we suddenly abandoned it. When I drive around in Bangalore, I love your city and thank you for inviting us here. I should have started like that. He knows how happy I am. That was him. But when I drive around, I feel I've landed on Mars. Thank you. No, you so what we'll do today, we'll try and talk about what makes cities, I mean, in culture, in terms of architecture. I want to, please, we want everyone to join in. And we will start really by, I will just start the process by saying, as architects, we see cities as buildings. We see them as streets, but we also all know that cities are people and cities are events. And the history of a city is not just the way it looks, it's what happened there. And what happens there happens in its, 
in its places where people meet. That is why the public spaces of a city are so important. And it's not just parks, parks are important. It's the places of, of mental and physical interaction where new ideas are born. This is where the institutions like libraries, museums, which actually add to that, that richness. Why don't you take over if you can? Yeah, good evening. Uh, as Charles was just now mentioning, and we have discussed it over uh, the last couple of days, uh, culture and the city. Now, whenever we talk about culture, we talk about certain institutions as if they make total culture. But culture is outside, uh, outside those institutions, and primarily so, institutions are supposed to represent a fragment of that. But culture is much wider a phenomenon. Whenever we talk about culture, we start to talk about museums. Everywhere, whenever there is something to be done in a city, or oh, what should we do in memory of so and so, well, let's make a museum. When there's some site available, what should we do with that site? Oh, let's make a museum. But I think a museum, in India at least, has also played some kind of uh, uh, non-role in that sense that the colonial institution of museum was for my feeling, and I spent at least 30 years working with museums, that the institution was still born in India. It, even today, as you all know, that when some inauguration takes place, something, then maybe 100, 150 people come, and after that, when you go to a museum, there, is, there are hardly any visitors. Museums are abandoned completely. Uh, people, have, uh, people don't anymore relate to that. I remember in 19, uh, 1990, when I, was, uh, I, I worked, uh, worked at Graf Museum, designed by Charles, and uh, we conducted an experiment in Delhi. In Connaught Place, we would stand and ask people whether they belong to Delhi. And at the CR, we asked about 150 people, have you been to the National Museum? I tell you, 80% of them said they didn't know where it was and what it was. So people don't go to museums. And those who go, they sometimes just take around uh, like that and go out. So museums did not work out. Now the entire burden of uh, uh, increasing visitorship uh, to museum has fallen on children. Because you know, uh, from all of them, children are carrying the burden of uh, continuing uh, receiving, receiving finances from government because the figure of visitorship goes up. Uh, you know. What happened to, uh, to that institution? I'll come to that, but before that I want to say that if we, we discarded the institution of museum, we did not discard our practice. We did not discard our connection with the past and the present art practices. And I'm so delighted to tell you that what has happened in the last 10 to 15 years is something phenomenal. That outside the museum, you know, so many things have begun to happen. Connection, I mean, uh, altogether the contemporary art practice is an extraordinary uh, expression of our social and uh, uh, political concerns, the society in which we live. Now, I know that in 2008, uh, in Delhi, I don't know, some of you might have heard about the India Art Fair in Delhi. This fair was started by, by two or three uh, uh, persons, and a girl called Neha, Neha Kripal, she was 25 years old, and she thought of starting an art fair because museums were so constrained and 90% of our cultural property and museums are owned by government and therefore highly uh, bureaucratic constraints and things like that. This girl, along with a few people, started this art fair. Uh, in first three art fair, uh, fairs, uh, something like more than two lakhs of people visited. When I went first time to the art fair, I felt that there were milling crowds of people. There was no space for people to move. 
you know, so many people, ordinary people from, from the streets were coming. You know, they were wondering, they were kind of curious, not really about what they were watching, but curious about the whole phenomenon of art that was happening. So museum was left aside, uh, and, but, but the energy and the creativity was not kind of left aside. And therefore, people began to uh, uh, come there. It was an extraordinary experience for me uh, to see this. Similarly, I found that, and you know all about uh, Kochi Art Fair, for example. Now, the last, uh, the first Kochi Art Fair it took place, four lakhs of visitors came to there. And who were these people? I think you said the whole of Delhi gets two lakhs in a, in a year. And he's Cochin got four lakhs in one shot. <laughs> people uh, came there. Now this is again another kind of space that people have created because museums uh, uh, lost their meaning. Uh, people find ways. For example, we are talking of city and culture. I remember four years ago, Maximilian Bhavan in Delhi created an event or put up an event in which they invited 15 artists and, the uh, and they were told to create uh, installation works related to environment. And the entire city of Delhi, spaces were taken by different artists. So in Connaught Place, in a, in a village within a Delhi, uh, within the city, somewhere near the old fort, and things like that. And 15 artists put up installations over there, and the entire city space uh, sort of became an important space for uh, for putting uh, putting up art, and which was I think seen by people, ordinary people. I think what is very important is that when an exhibition takes place, a hundred people come there, and these hundred maximum, and they are known to each other. It's almost like wedding reception that you know people come and say hello, and and they talk about each other's art. There's no no meaningful art criticism anywhere uh, in newspapers or things. So these are the people who are sort of uh, a kind of very promiscuous group. And we thought that we have lost art to, uh, to this kind of clique. But when, when we look at these alternative uh, sites that are being created for representing art in a city, for example, this uh, exhibition which Max Miller put up, it was called 48 degrees uh, centigrade. And here the artworks were huge, put up in Connaught Place and places, and people were coming and wondering and looking at things. So what I feel is that uh, that the city has many other such possibilities. I remember also an example for looking at alternate sites for swaying. Dhyanita Singh, the renowned photographer, uh, once told me, and I was in Goa with her at that time, that she had done family photographs of Goan families, middle class, uh, lower middle class families uh, somewhere, and she had done this work over a year. And then, instead of showing them in a museum or a gallery, she put up these photographs in those very families where uh, she had taken these photographs in a home, in the uh, living room and thing. And then she created a map of the city, and then she distributed this map and advertised, and people could follow that route and go and see in people's home and arrive there and people were very proud to see their photograph. They would give you a cup of tea and they would talk about the photograph, about themselves and things. So it's a new way of doing things. These are a couple of examples that I'm giving to say that when we talk of art and culture in the city, there are other possibilities and much more vibrant and much more <coughs> engaging and much more connecting uh, people with that than leaving it to be so elitist. Yeah, and uh, well, we are saying all this in the context of Bangalore. Because really, <laughs> you people are at your watershed point, where you all could go in for the conventional museum, and maybe we should. But I think these other ways, are like, what do you think the chances of that working over here? What do you think would happen? Uh, I, I suppose because this, what I said is not something difficult and I already heard about uh, architects meeting together and talking about things not architectural. So in a way, you know, uh, this kind of thing I have not seen uh, either in Bombay or in, uh, in Delhi, both the cities where I have lived for 
for many years. So I, I suppose that uh, the, the city of Bangalore would already be explored. What I like about, like what, what Dayanita did, is so impressive, so extraordinary for me that she was saying that I do not go to galleries. Either they are government galleries, they're bureaucratized, they're, they, you know, kind of, they don't understand what it is, or you go to private galleries where it's very highly commercial. And why must things must uh, be shown in that manner of uh, on a wall, something in a box yeah. and like you know, thing. Yeah. So I think the spaces of the city can be activated. Yeah. And uh, through that activation, space will become a kind of practiced place. Uh, and that possibility exists in every city. And I think it exists in Bangalore much more because it's such an intellectually vibrant city. So I think, and people here architecturally and otherwise in the last two days, uh, I have noticed how differently they are thinking. They are longing to do things differently. All the architect friends my met in the last two. So I think uh, something like that should be yeah, done. Also, also this thing of, uh, of uh, not putting it in a museum or, or a gallery, apart from the commercial, the horrors of the commercial world. The fact is, this has been, this has been debated, going back to Kumaraswamy. There was a man called Kumaraswamy, who, a hundred years ago, in Boston, who was the most brilliant man, if you get, you, you know his work and his essays. He raised this issue, he says, if this is the pot, made in, in uh, no, I don't need it, I'm just pretending it's a pot. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it's a pot, made in, um, say, Egypt, Upper <coughs> Nile, and I take it to the museum, and it's, I put it on a white wall at the Metropolitan. I, didn't, I denude it of any meaning. It is completely an abstraction. This is what is the new aesthetic which was created in the 19th century in Europe, in Paris and stuff, and became, and he, you know, I must be misquoting him, but he said the word they used was aesthetic. Aesthetic is like a, a ethos. Ethos is meaning. A aesthetic is, if I take away the meaning, how do you like it? It's like amoral. So in other words, if I don't know that this pot was used for bringing water from the well, what do you think of it? And I forgot the example he gives, but for us, it would be like going to Gone with the Wind or Shode, and you are colorblind, and you didn't follow the soundtrack, and you come out and say, great movie. That's what we do in a museum. Now what's good about Diane Anita, that she showed she gave it the context. There was no need for a catalog. So it would be wonderful, you people, who was doing all your dot com stuff and all, and your pubs and all that. If you could only put things in the context of where they are. Like, an example I would give you, if you looked at wine glasses and dis discussed them aesthetically, and you didn't know that the final glass is meant only for martinis because you, you had never read whoever re drinks martinis, Scott Fitzgerald and all these people. You could not make an appraisal of it. So context, Kumar Swami argued brilliantly about context. So when we did the Crafts Museum for Popul Jaika and Jutendra was appointed director, this was the biggest problem. You could take things, put them there, they'd look beautiful. And people said, no. And what should be the context, geographical, uh, chronological, which century? She said, no, there. Let's say there are three kinds of art, of crafts. One is village craft. One is sacred craft. One is palace craft. So we would have three areas. And I mean, it was so powerful, and what I did, all I had to do was make a street that you could go down courtyards, and if you saw something you like, you could go into caves and see that. It was such a powerful metaphor, because through that, I began to understand India. India, the all three 
are simultaneously important. All three coexist. All three have a different meaning to the object. I think. Yeah, I also think that um, this whole thing that happened with uh, like this fragmentation that happened. For example, uh, partly from colonial times, but immediately after independence, when Nehru's uh, first uh, five-year plan uh, schemes began. Major institutions of India, cultural institutions of India, were planned in the first five-year plan, and then a couple of them in the second five-year plan. Now, in that planning, uh, which I think so, it was because 1950, the first plan was initiated, and 55, second plan was initiated. These two plans have, uh, because we were in hurry, we got 1947 our independence and 50 made our constitution, and then Nehru uh, began with the planned economy. There, I think we went severely wrong, and therefore there was such fragmentation that happened and hierarchization of artistic expressions and traditions in the country. I give you an example. Uh, craft was identified, what the British used to call uh, artisanary and things. Now, craft was identified as one monolithic, whole all category in which all ritual arts, all artisanary, all women's art practices, embroidery, this, that, etc., wall painting, anything that was an expression outside the modern and something that was not ancient, all was put together under the category of craft. And craft was then put un uh, under the commercial ministry of, uh, 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 of industry. So the Department of Industry had small scale, uh, uh, small scale industries department, which was given in 1950s under the first plan, uh, a small budget to deal with entire visual expression of total village and rural communities of India under one, and their place was under the Ministry of Industry. After five years, the entire craft sector, that time there were at least seven million people, all the weavers and craftsmen, all set, at least the fate of at least seven million people was clubbed together under the category of craft and they were placed under the commercial ministry of industry and later on that was brought under the, the ministry of commerce. On the other side, contemporary art practices, modern art practices, etc., National Gallery of Modern Art was established and that was placed under the Ministry of uh, <coughs> Education, which was dealing with culture. So, modern art practices was culture, whereas total rural expression of people of India was, was commerce. So, commerce and culture, this is how, first of all, we hierarch hierarchized when we developed our, our institution. Since then, the entire development of, of complete expression of visual, uh, visual expression of uh, rural communities came under, so they would be uh, showing their work on pavements, they would be showing things uh, uh, on, on roadside, in melas, they would, they, their body language would change, they would come and bow to you, the best of craftsmen, best of folk artists, would when they, they would come. This is all, this entire thing, uh, the way we hierarchize today, has uh, sort of brought about some extraordinary injustice, and not only injustice socially, but it has reduced their expression to a very uh, a, a small uh, thing. That, I think, was something that happened. Similarly, design, for example. Now, design also became a part of, uh, part of that whole all big category. And then, when National Institute of Design was set up, it was placed under, not under the Ministry of Culture, but again under the Ministry of Industry. So, you know, there were different, and, and National Museum also was culture, but what is in National Museum is primarily uh, uh, craft-based. And I remember that when National Museum organized a purchase committee, 
And when they purchased <coughs> many objects, they would purchase 11th century South Indian Nataraj or this or that or whatever. And then later on, when it came out, so it was purchased as art, but when it came out that it was actually a fake object and made today, then it would be sent to Crafts Museum. So, uh, because uh, if it is ancient, it is art. If it is made today, it is craft. So, these are kind of very ad hoc things that happen, and that has led to, uh, uh, to tremendous injustice to uh, artistic expression of millions of people. I think also, as you said, is that also when you're in the Department of Commerce, how the Commerce Ministry can help you is getting you bigger orders. So if you produce this for 10 rupees, they say if you produce 1,000 for 5 rupees, here's the order. So you start to crank it out and spoil your art. Whereas wonderful people, lucky people like Hussein and all, were artists and came under culture and they were put under human resources. Now, so the, the craftsmen were producing a commodity according to the government. So you get the bigger sales. But I will submit if anyone has produced a commodity, it's our artists over the last three decades, a commodities which capitalism can speculate on. This is not the reason they paint, but this is the process. But no one calls that commercial. It's very frightening what he's saying, because finally they, we want to live in a box called modern contemporary. And, if, and the others are in a box called tribal, called, yeah. called yeah. Uh, whatever. And that is the real game going on in the art world, in India in general. And I don't know if anyone in, in the audience has something to contribute, but it's crucial. If you don't solve it, you will never bring back your, your handicraft and you will be always in a world of art which is a, nothing anywhere in the world but a world of the most crass uh, capitalistic speculation. I'm sorry. I'm not against capitalism. Actually, I am. But I would never. <laughs> I think it's terrible that they got oh, You know, one of the nicest things about being an architect because we live in such a bloody commercial world but you don't get any more fees or any less fees than Corbusier. It's the same. It's not like Picasso. <laughs> secondly, secondly, a house by Frank Lloyd Wright put up on the market isn't worth $10 more than a house by someone else. That keeps you human. That stops people speculating. If you do something better, it's because you want to. That's the one wonderful thing about being an architect, I think. But I'd like, I'd like you to tell us more if you feel, if the audience is interested in this whole thing about how the craftsmen and the artists and these two boxes yeah. and what happens. Yeah. Um, Especially uh, in terms of, of uh, what you said, the, uh, the, uh, the biography that, you know what, Ganga Dev, Ganga Dev for example, uh, a mention was made about uh, an exhibition that I had curated with this in mind that it, the British had told us that Indians are not, they are not creative, they are not innovative, but they are excellent in craftsmanship and they are repetitive. And later on, by placing craft as a, I mean craft which included complete rural expression. So I'm not only talking of uh, weaving or making craft object, but complete uh, uh, artistic expression all under uh, as long as it wasn't modern. When this happened, I uh, wanted to question this. And I was talking to a contemporary artist who had worked uh, for many years in, in a weaver service center. Uh, uh, I don't know if some of you know that Government of India, in order to develop a handloom, uh, they created a chain of about 21 weaver service centers in the country. 
and India some of the top Indian artists, including K.G. Subramaniam, who is having an exhibition at the National Gallery of Modern Art here in Bangalore, and Prabhakar Barve, and even for a while, M.F. Hussain as consultant, and many important artists were working in Viva Service Center centers in, in India. And, um, uh, you know, around that time, uh, it was believed that folk artists were repetitive, they, you know. So I thought that I want to question that and wanted to, uh, so I selected, you no, know, I talked to one such artist who worked in Weaver Service Center. He was in the same ministry as I was, and that was Ministry of Commerce. But I was director of Crafts Museum, which came under the Ministry of Commerce, and he was working in Weaver Service Center. Ordinary artist, a mediocre, I'll not mention his name, uh, but really, truly, uh, an ordinary, mediocre artist, you know. Uh, and since I'm going to deal with the issue of creativity, which is entirely sort of uh, appropriated by uh, by contemporary or modern modernist artists, I want to bring. Uh, I wanted to do a point. So I uh, I met him. He had uh, taken early retirement, and uh, when I met him, and he said, uh, "Oh, you know, are you still with the government?" I said, "Yes." Uh, he said, "I left three four years ago." So and I am now devoted completely a whole time to uh, my art practice and. The mediocre artist tells me, I'm considered a modern master. So when he said this, immediately and spontaneously, a phrase came to my mind, and what about uh, other masters? Because he was particularly working with, uh, you know, Weaver Service Center, he has seen the great genius of Indian Weavers. And they, so from that, I did this exhibition, and I selected five uh, village artists to show uh, that how wonderfully creative they were, and that this entire scene of their creativity have just put us, we have put aside. Uh, uh, and so one of the examples that I want to bring is that of a woman called Ganga Devi. Ganga Devi was uh, uh, from Mithila, from Madhubani, and she was a traditional artist from Bihar. Uh, and uh, she used to do a little bit of uh, ritual wall paintings when she was young, helping her mother and things like that. She got uh, married to a uh, to a very poor man, and uh, after marriage she came to the house of this man, and uh, uh, she gave birth to a daughter who was uh, who died at the time of her birth itself, and then um, she was uh, disliked by her husband, and somehow or the other they continued uh, like because she didn't give birth to a male child or to a child at all. Uh, at some point of time, Gangadhi's husband. Uh, married another woman. And Ganga Devi said that, yeah, he was right because uh, we didn't have a male child and therefore uh, he was right. And, you know, she didn't take it because in that society it was perhaps okay. So he, uh, and uh, the new woman came to the house. And one day Ganga Devi said that the new woman who came to the house, uh, she and her husband, and her husband came to her room, which she was living outside in the compound in a thatch hut. And she came, uh, both of them came one afternoon and told Ganga Devi, uh, she said uh, on, a, on a tape, I recorded her life, I wrote a book on her. She said, uh, they, she said they, they both came like decoids in the afternoon and came and told me to open my, uh, my trunk, uh, what in Bihar they call baksa. So she said, uh, uh, you stand here and open your baksa. And then she said that they began to plunder everything uh, that was there. And she said, my entire world was plundered. And what was that world? She described two saris, a few bangles, uh, a silver coin, which would, she would put on a heap of rice and do her morning uh, 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 worship, etc., uh, a cake of soap, and a few other things. And she said that, she took the marriage uh, of her husband and co-wife and everything. But when this happened, this was her entire world that was plundered. And then she said that I began to cry, and while crying, I fell asleep. And she said, when I woke up in the afternoon after my sleep, she said, it occurred to me that I can paint. Uh, because she used to help her mother in doing ritual paintings, etc. And then out of a personal circumstance of this woman, 
she suddenly thought that I can paint and I need not depend on my husband or uh, my co uh, uh, the co-wife. And then she went to the house of another woman to whom a Frenchman used to come and he used to buy paintings annually. So she went to her and said, uh, give me some sheets of paper, I will also paint and when this Frenchman comes here, uh, you also sell my painting. So she said, okay. So she, she took her, uh, she used to give her sheets of paper and that is how Ganga Devi, out of completely personal circumstances, uh, uh, started to paint. Now, parallelly, imagine situation of artists, other artists in cities and all, they come out of different situation. Okay, she started to paint. Now, this woman told Ganga Devi that I will do this, but you are not allowed to sign your, your works. So, when the Frenchman came, he was called Yves Veco, who later on wrote a very renowned book on painter, women artists of Mithila. So, when he came, Ganga Devi, he saw all the painting and he recognized that Ganga Devi's works were extraordinary and they were not stylistically the works of that other woman. So he said, whose works are these? So she said, mine. The other woman said, they're mine. So he said, no, I don't think they are your work. If you don't tell me, I will not buy your works. So she said, okay, they are not mine, my works, but I won't tell you whose work. But since he liked the works, he bought a bunch of these. And then he looked at it and at the back somewhere, Ganga Devi had written her name and which was scratched. So he went to the Ganga, uh, he went to Government of India's office and uh, said, who is this woman Ganga Devi? So they said there is an unfortunate woman living, you know, outside the house of her husband somewhere in a hut and, um, you know. So this Frenchman came there and then Ganga Devi says that uh, a car came and stood outside my house and she said, just looking from attached uh, wall, I just saw and she said uh, from the car uh, a white man came out. She said a Gora Admi came out and he said, is there anybody called Ganga Devi here? So uh, uh, Ganga Devi said that putting aside all sense of shame, I just came out and said I am Ganga Devi. And uh, Ramchandra uh, Gandhi, Ramu Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson once told me that it had to be a white man. Okay. Uh, then, uh, then he um, he gave uh, large, large pieces of paper to Ganga Devi and an extraordinary series of paintings she did. She did huge work. We'd never seen large paper. Paper was not available that time at all. And it was Pupul Jaikar and Mrs. Indira Gandhi that uh, because Mithila was continuously affected by droughts and women had, people had no money and they had extraordinary, every house had beautifully painted walls. So paper began to be distributed uh, in Mithila uh, for, by Pupul Jaikar and Indira, on Indira Gandhi's advice and, uh, and this entire thing that you all know as Madhubani painting is a revolution that came. What paper did was something very interesting because when they painted on the wall, they only painted ritual iconography. They painted only on a certain wall. They were limited to a certain scale and uh, they could not go beyond. But as soon as paper came, there was this explosion of creativity that took place and Ganga Devi was among the leading uh, artists who then deviated from just <coughs> confining to ritual painting to, to many expressions. And then I remember, uh, I wanted to bring this point about creativity, uh, that at some point of life, Ganga Devi got a lot of recognition, she got a Padma award, she was sent abroad in all the festivals of India and thing. And then later on, she got cancer. And uh, that time she came to Delhi and uh, we brought her to uh, the All India Institute, uh, uh, Institute of uh, Med Medical Sciences. And first she, uh, she was not being admitted, but uh, through intervention of Sonia Gandhi, somehow she got admission. 
and uh, uh, she was uh, cured to some extent, but she had to, to be in hospital for a long time. I'm coming to a point of uh, this creativity. First of all, folk and tribal artists never do autobiographical works. It is contemporary artists, contemporary writers, novelists who, who, who do autobiographical thing in their work. Ganga Devi, after her cancer, she had to be in Delhi. So we had housed her in Crafts Museum where I used to work because we had to go periodically to the hospital. And she said, uh, during that chemotherapy period, she said, give me some uh, paper. So we gave her sheets of paper. And what she did was, she did a series of six paintings based on her cancer treatment and that period and that whole experience and how she came from her village and how village co uh, village cocks were uh, uh, cheating her. People were giving her a tube uh, and taking a lot of money and said, apply uh, to your uh, on your body and you will be all right. And so she was she was cheated. All this, you know, she began to do. And then when she came to Delhi, she had to lie down flat uh, uh, in a bed. And her, uh, her angle of looking at things changed. So she was, when she was lying flat for hours in bed, then she began to see ceiling fan. So in her painting of cancer day, ceiling fan began to appear, temperature chart would appear, whatever she could see from that angle, uh, you know, uh, all this came. Now, how do we say that village artists have no creativity, they are repetitive? It was paper which expanded the scope of expression and she utilized it so wonderfully in these four paintings. They are so, so moving, uh, 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 the, the work that she did. Similarly, this Maharashtrian painter, Jivya Somamashi, and he was commissioned by the gallery Kemold in Bombay to do a series of... And first time when he came to Bombay and landed in Bombay Central Railway Station, uh, he was so frightened of looking at the presence of policemen and things like that. And all that began to enter uh, his work. And like that, these five uh, other masters whose works I showed were all... Uh, all of them uh, had, had gone beyond the inherited tradition and extraordinary expression of their subjectivity that came in. And, and that's why after this exhibition, I think many years later, uh, a major museum in France uh, uh, asked me to do an expanded version of other masters. And I assure you that there are, there are hundreds and thousands of uh, artists in India who are now reflecting upon their personal, social, and political predicament in their work. But we are not interested because the territories are divided. The galleries belong to contemporary and modern artists with influence, and the rest are not contemporary. But I assure you that they are reflecting in a very, very, uh, uh, very subtle manner to their contemporary predicament around them. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the power game. I mean, the fact is, we should distinguish between contemporary and modern as a style. They're not modern, but they're as contemporary as anyone. And they're probably, from what you say, they're more alive to stimuli than, than most so-called modern artists. Yeah. So they're not modernist, and nobody's claiming yes. that. But that doesn't mean and, and, that it cannot be contemporary. And this is a very, very important point, even for the culture of a city, not to be caught in a trap in a little box called yeah. Yeah. modern or yeah. museum. But listen, I think we're talking too much. <laughs> and I think it would be nice if one of you, either Edgar or please, thanks, be joy, if you came and guided us and also got the audience involved. Come bring a chair here. I think we'll, we'll just open up to questions. But I, just listening to the two of you speak, I mean, the, the one thing that strikes me that, I mean, the story of, uh, you know, the artist Ganga Devi and this idea that it is, in some sense, a personal, personal endeavor. It's, you know, one taking one's own sort of initiative and doing things. Even the example of these art things that are happening outside of the museum, they're all sort of, it's, you're not waiting for someone to say, hey, come on, you know, let's do this. Um, 
it's it's very inspiring and it, it sort of opens my mind that maybe it is it is time not to wait anymore. You know that, that there is the city, there is the culture, but there's also us individuals, all of us. I'd like to open it up to questions. It would be wonderful if we can have a nice conversation with with uh, both Professor Jane and Mr. Korea. This is a question to Professor Jane. Uh, so when we speak of contemporary art, modern art, so Anand Kumar Swami also spoke about education and educating the artists. And as we see, our education is more kind of a producing prototypes and our own uh, education system is kind of producing graduates and without any aesthetic sense. And also as we see, he wrote a book on bugbear of literacy. Again, as you know, Kamla Devi also went like the artists and you, their children are not taking up art anymore. They also all want to go become engineers and go to NID and what sorts. But they are not really taking a part anymore because of, as we know we are concentrating on GDP and what development and technology and all of this technology is really ruining the art and artists. So what is your take on how do we kind of uh, protect art? As you know Kamla Devi, like, there are no people like Kamla Devi who really kind of go to villages, really make the artists, children to take a part. So everyone is coming to a city, take a, becoming a sec security guard or something and like, that's the end of it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it is very unfortunate. For example, the next generation of uh, uh, craftspeople, artisans and folk artists, they are not interested in taking up uh, that profession because they consider it, uh, because they have been put at such a lower level that after going to school and after learning a little bit fiddling on computer and things like that, they don't anymore feel like going back to that level because as I said, that right at the planning level, we had given them a different position and I think uh, as a result, they are, they are somehow or not, somehow the other not interested. Uh, I think in our educational system, this division and this hierarchization of uh, artistic practices, I think somewhere or the other, if we do not break that, I think this will uh, will continue. So maybe I think uh, all our entire school education in which the way we define art and the way we talk about art, uh, I think if it doesn't change, uh, it would be uh, perhaps uh, it won't happen at all. The whole name, because uh, I continuously as director of Crafts Museum, I used to meet craft people and their children. They were, they were not, they were not interested in taking up because it was considered and considered lower. And if you know, in the earlier uh, social in, uh, classification of India, craftspersons were uh, sort of classified as shudras, the lowest of the low, and uh, they, that also added uh, to uh, to the the whole thing of. Uh, uh, these, this segment of artistic expression being uh, marginalized. You had once, uh, I mean you made this distinction between art and design and, and the idea that somehow amongst architects we all aspire to be the artists and create things of sublime beauty but of no use. No, 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 sorry. We must, we should create things of sublime beauty. That's your, that's your job. But don't make a useless object of sublime beauty. Architecture has to do with use, like this table. But I'm glad you brought that. I'd like to, if you are interested, we should discuss this more in the context of Bangalore. And I think what Jyotindra has said is very important and it will resonate in your head for some days or weeks to come. And you'll find many parallels. While he was talking, I was thinking to myself, this city of Bangalore, when I first saw it, it was a small cantonment with little houses in Langford Town or whatever they were called, or Richmond Town, whatever. It was basically suburbia. It was the British or the Anglo Indian idea of how you lived, and it goes all the way to Jefferson's White House. It's anti urban, it's completely different from a colonial town like Pondicherry, which is French, and the streets actually connect buildings. But it was at least, it had a small scale. Now, what I find frightening is that 
if you look at something like the Honorable Charles we have in Bombay or the Bastis in Calcutta, they are communities. That's very important. However terrible they are, people know each other, they help each other. You all are moving from that little cantonment town to multi-story high-rise buildings which don't build community. And your way to react is to make them gated because you understand the dangers of anonymity and hostility. It's a brutal combination. People whom you don't know who can mug you, which is what happens in America, and you can't do anything about it. You try and keep them out with the gate. Then you move into much more frightening territory. You are moving away from the possibility of a community life. It is almost a parallel of what you said. And I wonder did anybody in the audience or any one of your architects, you must have thought of the dangers of these gated communities, the ugliness of them and us. And which wasn't at all the character of Bangalore people. You are a very hospitable, gentle people, but there's a there's a phrase of Churchill, who is not my biggest <laughs> hero. <laughs> and Churchill said, we build our buildings and then our buildings build us. So just be careful, 10 years down the line. Uh, with that, you know, I want to, um, I remember one of, uh, when I used to be, uh, whenever Charles came to some of the sites and uh, he just phoned me and said, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to Bhopal and I'm doing this Vidhan Sabha building or I'm going to Jaipur and uh, working on um, Javakala Kendra or something. Talking about people, uh, community, people, art and architecture, I remember an extraordinary incident that uh, incident that I went to Bhopal <coughs> and um, the building of Vidhan, uh, Vidhan Sabha Bhavan, the Madhya Pradesh Assembly Building was uh, uh, just finished and a few things were uh, being installed and Charles had acquired a group of sculpt terracotta sculptures of the artist Regu. Uh, and uh, this comprised of four people, a man, you know, this size, this size figures, you know, uh, so most of you might be familiar with the work terracotta figures of Regu. These were like, uh, you know, he always did these figures with uh, people with open mouth looking upwards for some kind of hope, you know. Uh, so there was a, a group of sculptures uh, that Charles had acquired, a man, woman, and two children. And this group made a family. And uh, we were discussing where to place them and what to do. If you place in a building somewhere in a corner, they become decorative objects. You know, okay, you know, you put some art in a building. So that would happen. And obviously Charles wouldn't do that. So finally, as we, we came out of the building, and where uh, the, the, the building, the, the built space uh, was next to uh, an open lawn, and next to the lawn, there was this driveway. So that was the outer periphery of the complex. And Vidhan Sabha, the assembly, is the house of people, people, elected representative of people. So Charles said, I remember on the spur of the uh, uh, thing, he said, you know, why not we put this family on the edge of the lawn because these poor people, you know, they have no hope to enter this house of representatives of people. They don't know what's going on inside the assembly. So they would rather be outside and then we put this family of four people just standing there and helplessly looking skywards. We commissioned Rego to make a little group. Yeah, the but, but the basement, I'm this talking size, about. the building is quite a beautiful building, but it is a monumental government building. But it's not more than yeah. 25 feet there. But to put these little people, That's you hard. realize what every you do as an architect, you are on the other side, frightening them. And <laughs> you know, it's like should they? from a double height. So we must understand, you know, uh, the, the tremendous gulf which we have to check. Yeah, just this placement was such a powerful social-political yeah, comment. 
but I'd like to get back to gated communities and things like that, which I don't know if you people ever discuss. You must be. Are you concerned? Um, yeah, I, I had a question somewhat related to what you were talking about, the ugliness and the modernity of a city. Um, good evening. Yeah, I'm firstly very grateful to be here and I'm also very honored because I live in a building uh, that's designed by Charles Courier. We live in a NIC colony in Jeevan Bhima Nagar and I think that colony has been designed by him and I just have to say it is the most wonderful space uh, to live in. But being, you know, coming from there, I see our city as, um, as the ugliness that it portrays through the metro and uh, buildings related to the metro that's come up. And my question is always how, um, how do we as the public uh, intervene or have any hand, uh, you know, in, in the processes of the government and the public domain? And uh, how do we even begin to, to question it? Or, or, I'm, and I'm not an architect, so I don't know if I necessarily have a role. I, I, I don't know the process in, in Bangalore, but usually the plans of the government have to be shown of the authorities. Now that's where a lot, where a lot of uh, uh, smoke can be created. They don't, they show it to you, but they don't really bother with your comments. In actual fact, you know, you have the right, and we should enforce it, that until it's been passed, I'll give you two examples. One is, of course, your Mahatma Gandhi Road. For years, I was saying yesterday, there were years, uh, you know, because I was not doing buildings in Bangalore, but I was, uh, I was on the Bangalore, what's it called? BD, BD, BD. So I'd be asked, and some building would come up, wanting to come up on MG Road, and there was a fellow called T.P. Isad. Is he still around? Is he young? T.P. is uh, one comment that he was absolutely emphatic. They must be Gothic windows. <laughs> so, architects were producing 20 story buildings with Gothic windows. And that's it. T.P. won differences. It's an ugly building anyway, beautiful, but why? So anyway, that was, so it was a status quo, and people got used to that. And then suddenly, unbeknownst to anybody, came these railway people, like criminals, there's no other word, in the middle of the night, and they come down with concrete, the metro, and destroy MG Road, for the next 500 years <laughs> until that country goes. So I happened last time I was here to meet the chief engineer who was very proud of what he had done. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I said, why didn't you go? What's the next road? It's called uh, Carbon Road. Carbon Road. Meet the ball. Why didn't you go underground? He said, no, we used all our money to go underground near Vidhan <laughs> We started to discuss, and yesterday I, I was just repeating it. You know, at the Vidang Southern intersection, you've got three completely different buildings, which was intentional of G. V. K. Rao, who was your very good chief secretary. One is British, one is Hanumanthaya's Vidang Southern, and the third is the LIC building. And if between them, there was an elevated railway, but it should be made out of stainless steel, very elegant, and every five minutes, like a bat from hell, comes this train. <laughs> that would, because GVK said, we must say, what is the new Bangalore? And that's what, that's what architecture, it's the aspirations of what you want to become. No, if he had done, even if he had done this horrible my MG Road thing in steel, you all could have dismantled it. <laughs> Serious. One thing, one thing I would recommend that he, 
in today's India, the price of steel and concrete construction. I don't think it will vary more than 10% or less or 15 but the retrieval cost of concrete is impossible. And you should insist that whatever they build, if you can't stop it, if you can't blow them up, insist that it's demountable. <laughs> I'd also like to invite Sankal to join us. There's the building, but then there's all of the stuff that's between the buildings. The space, you know, the main plaza, the tropical garden, the amphitheater. That's the heart of the project. Um, and it, it comes through so, so strongly in the film that, it, of course, you have the laboratories and all of the treatment <coughs> facilities, but the heart of the project is outside of all that. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Sankal, about your experience? Um, I don't know whether the heart of the project is outside. I think the heart of uh, the building, the, the functioning, usable part of the building is very much inside. And then, I think uh, the garden, I think sort of links all the spaces because the garden is where uh, people who are undergoing chemotherapy are also uh, like looking at the garden and uh, are able to uh, sort of have all the benefits of science, but also contact with nature. And all the other scientists who are working in the neuroscience also constantly have a view of the garden and can look at the sea also. So I think uh, the building works by itself and I don't think it's uh, uh, in a way, let's say, only working because of the pathway. But what the entire site does and what the pathway does for the site is that first of all, I mean what Charles just said, it unfrightens people. It is such an accessible point. It is a point of access and it's inviting. One thing that I noticed and that's what I, I pointed to Charles also, that first you get pulled into your intrigue because of those two, two pillars there. And it's something, I don't know, some strange psychological thing. Once you start walking along that pathway, you have to reach the end. And that's when you see the sea. You see the, that, that, the unlimited thing. And it's, there is a payoff. It's a beautiful payoff at the end of it. And I think that, I don't know what, it's very mysterious. It's really, I've been on the side there, I've looked at the footage, etc. Et but I, I still don't and cannot understand the enigmatic nature of that space, really. Yeah, I'm just going to say, it actually, the point of the building is something slightly different. It's, um, I was interested in using, at that time I didn't have cancer. And I thought, if ever I got cancer, I would like to look at the blue sky, at the sea, at nature. And then if I said, if there was, I would like to think of beauty as therapy. And so the architecture must be helped. It, so in other words, at the end of it all, before it opened, a lot of people came to see it. It's very famous there in Portugal. And they all thought, it's going to be a museum of modern art. <laughs> so I was so proud that it wasn't. I'm so, I'm so ashamed that architects no longer produce things like schools, housing, but they produce two completely. You see, if you produce housing, you have to know that you have to know the climate, the income level, the lifestyle. When you produce a museum, it's completely culture free. It's completely free of climate. And the other thing is the airport. And if you are an ordinary architect in, in the West, you do housing. If you're really a superstar, you do only airports and museums. <laughs> Yet the finest building Gropius ever did for me is the bar house to be the only piece of architecture he ever produced. And I think the fact that he believed education was important 
So we're talking about what is the underlying belief in our bones that makes housing. It's not something you do for people. And that is tragic. It's gone out of our lives. And to me, that is the point of the building. I mean, where the space is covered and open is another set of games. But I wish we understood the importance of architecture in what Churchill said. In fact, at the NG and at the NCPA, Bombay, they ran this firm, and they had a brilliant doctor called Udwadia, who is coming with them probably, and he was very interested, and he came, and he spoke like this, and he gave examples, <coughs> wonderful examples, that when certain music is played, of course, these were all Western examples. For instance, Mozart, some of his sonatas, increases the amount of endocrine or something secreted in the brain. Cows give better milk when they hear <laughs> The thing is, yeah. in fact, there's a Parsi General Hospital in Bombay, and I've never been inside so here for Parsis. I think Xerxes may know it. I saw Xerxes somewhere. But anyway, the thing is, someone describing it to me said there's a garden and there's a set of rooms going around like a courtyard. And then there's a corridor, which is a veranda facing the outside, the road. So every room looks at the garden. And then they said this, when people have to exercise, we walk in the garden. And then I realized that is the traditional pattern of the French and European hospice. <coughs> That's what they did. They saw nature as therapy. When I was in the hospital, I had to do my exercise along a double-loaded corridor, <laughs> dodging whoever was coming. <laughs> so I thought, what are we talking about? We are architects. I have two narration and one song. And I request you to allow me to say that because I'm not sure next time when you come, I'm alive or not. Honestly, Vimal is a dear friend of mine. And to introduce myself, I'm the villain in the hero's group. I'm a developer, so-called. <laughs> Supposed to do the chopping and cutting and flattening. Why are you doing it? <laughs> Thank you. Thankfully, from inception. Yeah. Sir, uh, I was a broker in 1986 and I fixed your house in Koramangla third block through Auto Associate Hussein said. That is one aspect. Number two, for me, there are three Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwar. In that, B.V. Joshi, sir, Mahindra Raji, and your good self. I had a great opportunity to meet those two. This is the first time I got the opportunity to you know, meet you, sir. I came to Bangalore in 1980 from Mangalore, a, a village near Mangalore. When I came to Bangalore here, you know, my uncle, my late uncle, took me and my wife uh, to show us uh, Vidana Sauda. That was the only one piece of architecture at that point of time. We saw Sunday the color Vidana Sauda. I was just walking. They were all looking at Vidana Sauda, and I was looking at your LIC building. Believe me, I'm a school dropout. I was not knowing anything about architecture. I used to talk about column, beam, beam, column. Your friend, uh, we, you know, Manoj and uh, Sandeep will vote for that. But what I, what I was, what was, you know, unique about your architecture, for me, everything was symmetric. But your LSE building was not symmetric. It was distinctly different. When I went to Mumbai, I make a point. I, I stay generally in uh, uh, Mazgaon, you know, from or Dadar. From there, I go to airport. But then I take a route of uh, Marine Drive and I make a point to see your Kanchenjunga. Carmichael Road, I must see, and otherwise my, my Mumbai trip is not complete. I go to Delhi, I see your LIC building, the structural glazing. This is about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, your great self, I'm really blessed today. And about women, if I have to compare architecture terror to a human body, my friend Sandeep was a brain. Is a brain. Vimal is a body. Manoj is a body. But Vimal, he was the heart and soul. 
of our teacher Tarakai. What a great personality, sir. He never worked with me directly because, you know, they have put Manoj for us, you know, to, to deal with. But whenever there was any issue, any misunderstanding, it happens. You know, he is a person. And if I have to describe Vimal in two words, values and relationship. And I conclude my talk with the, with the memory of Vimal. Chalte, chalte, mere ye geet yaad rakna. Kabhi alvida na chalna. I understand he likes Kishore Kumar. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a question about the fragmentation of the cities through gated communities that are emerging everywhere. And in your wisdom uh, over the years, do you think our society of consumers, modern consumers, which includes developers, buyers, you know, consumers of modern of architecture today, are they ready to uh, consume something which is not fragmented, you know, something which is not gated? Are they ready? Because we can see that they're trying to break away from the fragmentation in arts, like uh, Dr. Jain said, you know, this revival of art fairs and things like that. But in architecture, it's, it's a much harder battle. You know, excuse me. Um, when I started, I mentioned to you that cities are about people and events, and they need public spaces, shared public spaces, for those events to happen. The great cities, like I would put Jaipur there, certainly Paris, London, all the public spaces are shared. And that's true even today of San Francisco, Boston, Americans don't have gated communities. They have them in places like Los, Los Angeles or something. What you're looking at here is not a, is not a true urban model. It is, it is a capital, really. It's the worst kind of of what you call it market forces, in which Americans had wonderful cities. In the 19th century, there were cities like St. Louis. There's anyone seen a movie called Meet Me in St. Louis with Judy Garland? No. Well, why don't you see it? It's a, it's a, it's a movie. It's a typical of a family who, an American family, who won't live the city this they love because it has schools and hospitals. And now if you go to St. Louis, it's a place of mugging. You go to Detroit, they just shoot you as you go by. The antagonism is so great. We go to America and see the money that is being made there. And, and we also see Americans living in suburban houses. I don't know how we don't realize how lonely and desperate those poor people feel. The one city in America which actually really works in terms of high-rise buildings is Manhattan. And Manhattan, nobody has a car except, first of all, the only families left are very rich whites, very poor blacks. All the middle class ran away. That's what will happen to your Bangalore, what's, what's happening to Bombay. And then the city starts to become confrontational. It's happened not just in America, it's happened in Nairobi, Johannesburg, everywhere, to Sao Paulo. Nothing be, could be nicer than the Brazilian people with the beautiful songs and bossa nova, and then they knife each other because of confrontation. So this image of the gated community is not about cities, it's about a way of market forces selling real estate. And it ruins cities. And it's advocated by firms like McKinsey, who are totally irresponsible, who know nothing about planning. And they, and they get, get away with it. I'm not against developers. So let me tell you, one of the greatest cities in the world was made by London. In London was made by developers, but by making the city, they made a lot of money and they made a beautiful city. They didn't ruin the city. You people have that choice, so don't pretend you don't. Please, I won't buy that. Find a way to make, develop Bangalore and make it beautiful. 
Okay, get out of here. You have no right to do something. This is important. I'm sorry you have to make me say this. And if you've given that poor girl in the third last row the idea that she has no choice but a gated community, that's pathetic. That's pathetic. In a great city, in a country which still has New Delhi, where all the great public spaces are shared, on Sunday are shared. Why did you speak? My voice is gone. Speak. <laughs> I, say, I, I think you say that they, I don't know. You know, when you returned, there was uh, hope. Uh, you know, there was building of the nation. There was many things happening. Now, 50 years later, there's a shrill cry, you know, saying, uh, smart cities. Now, we are actually unable to come to terms with uh, uh, handling the problems that we have in the cities that we already have. Yeah. How does one actually, because you've been so successful in uh, handling projects for government, how does one actually confront a situation like this and make, bring sense into the so-called builders of the ideas that these people well, are? I, I think smart cities could mean many things. It could mean higher connectivity, or it could be also all the way up. I, I think we have to be realistic. I think we have to worry about everyone in the city. A friend of mine, Ramu Ayer, you know him. He's written a book on Bombay, and a very gentle book, not like the way I, I speak. <laughs> but there's suddenly in the middle of it all, he's got this ominous chapter which says, you can judge a city by how the poor live. So we have a responsibility. We are, we are making Bombay into a city where the well-to-do can go on our, on our ceiling. You know, I was saying just yesterday, if you go on sea, you know the ceiling? Yeah. It's not open to buses. You'll never see a taxi. But you'll see a lot of expensive cars. And it's a very quick way to the airport. And if I'm going to the airport for about a minute and 38 seconds, I can hallucinate that I'm in Seattle, <laughs> that I'm in San Francisco. I don't have to think of all this poverty and all, all this bus, bullet, look at bullet guns, not even buses. Now what would happen if the ceiling was reserved for the first one hour, two lanes, only for public transport. There are four lanes. You know the amount of pressure to take off. Why don't we think of these things? You know, it is a failure of our imagination. And let's not blame the government. We should come up with ideas and you should force them through. Really, that's the best way to deal with the government and in my advice. Just explain, just work out something because your, your traffic problems here are, are horrendous. You know that. Unless you bring in public transport, you're affordable. And that means surface transport. It's more like Kuritiba, the buses. You know, you're going to have a terrible city, which actually is. And it's such a beautiful city. And you've got all this air conditioning, etc. I mean, in the automatic, natural. You just have to, but, but I think when you are, when you notice that you are giving too much, too much FSI because there are too many cars on the road, that's very late, much before you, you run out of car space, you run out of schools, of hospitals. In Bombay it's happened, I don't know about it. Yeah. So the thing is, you should look into these I've got some work in UDRI. If you come to Bombay or if you come to Goa, we'll give you the biggest places. And you can see that we are going way past the point of, of diminishing returns. Because we are only looking for why you get there. But all the things that make the city are the spaces outside your house. The, 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 the playgrounds, the because now Americans train in that in, except for one or two cities, and ruin their cities. No one, no one can live, live in Cleveland. No one can live in Maine. But people live in Paris, 
they live in Venice. The importance of interactive public spaces creates the culture, creates the history of that city. Even when the Great India Movement was launched in Gwalior time, it's so it's not a question of a, of a gated community, nor even it's a question of a public arena. And you could have, with this wonderful climate, you, I think you were saying, you don't even need restaurants to move into open spaces, right? What a city you could have. You must make a scheme, take a small section of it. Do it in, in, in Rimmer's name. I think that's the last, I'm very impressed, as someone said earlier, with all of you, what I've seen, it's the liveliest bunch of architects. And now you've got a crusade in his name, start saving the city. Start, start fighting the stupidity of market forces. Market forces made, never made a city. It made a, a lot of money for a few people. Then leave town. But it never made a great city. And you know it. Because cities involve other values. You must make money. I'm not saying you lose. But you should have many other goals. Then you are an intelligent, balanced society. Otherwise, you're myopic, frankly. Thank you so much, Sankar. That was an incredible film. And thanks for sharing. Thanks for sparing the time and coming. Uh, we're really honored to have you. Professor. One of the things that, you know, we tried and uh, eventually didn't actually uh, put in the film was an overt explanation of the idea of the non-building. Because it uh, was something that, you know, if you try to put in words, somehow, you know, it takes away. It's like trying to explain poetry or trying to explain a joke. So, but at the same time, I guess it's something that's worth thinking about, you know, the the question of uh, what is at the heart of why that building really moves you so much? Why is it that there's always this uh, people who've been there and even a lot of people who see the film? Apart from the other things, there's always this kind of a sense of being uh, transformed or being touched somewhere and very vitally. And of course, the those forms are open-ended forms and they sort of in a way uh, defy easy comprehension so you look at it and you keep or you keep trying to look at it and there's a point at which you sort of feel or or at least admit to yourself that I am not going to be able to understand this I'm not going to be able to give a label to this form or oh this is this and uh, you know the the point at which your intellect surrenders, so to say, <clears throat> and you sort of then at that point learn to accept that space or accept that place as a place that you know is maybe like an extension of your own consciousness or I don't know uh, whether that the space is allowing you to shape your consciousness in some way. And at that point I think uh, something wonderful happens. That that thing that you're trying to uh, see, and in the act, in the word seeing, is the question of comprehension and understanding and labeling. <clears throat> when you can't see it anymore, is when the building becomes a non-building. So it's it's just something. It's a it's it's a it's an experience. It's a phenomenological experience, let's say. But it's not something that you can see and consume and finish off. That was something that we wanted to. So it's in venues like this, etc., where we can talk about it and perhaps discuss. But it's not something that we could put in the film. But uh, I mean, among men, so many vital and deep ideas of Charles's. I think the idea of the non-building 
is something that uh, you know at least I find extraordinarily amazing. Professor Jain, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Um, you've enriched us. It's been a wonderful session. Um, and uh, Mr. Korea, uh, it's such a privilege. We're so happy. None of this would have happened, you know, if you'd said you couldn't come. It's just been such a pleasure to have you. We're so, so happy. And despite your voice, <laughs> you have to come again when, when you know. My voice. <laughs> thank you, thank you for asking us. We speak for Monica too. We're so happy to be here.